Well, good morning. This is Pastor Jim Taylor from Haven Baptist Church in sunny Kunsan in South Korea on a cloudy day. And uh, this is this week's session of Your Questions Answered. And uh, I've got a couple of good questions for today. One of them is on something called CBGM, which uh, it's pretty technical, and I'll have to explain all of that when we get into the discussion. The second one is on alcohol, the Christian and alcohol and there's some uh, details to the question, which I will uh, get to uh, when we get to that subject. In the future, we've got some pretty good questions coming up. I've got a good list of questions here. Uh, someone wants to know about suicide, and um, if you commit suicide as a Christian, would you be lost? Um, questions about God being all-powerful, and why did he create men if he knew that they were going to fall? Um, some questions about heaven and what's in heaven and who's in heaven and that sort of thing. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, you know, whether or not uh, there are animals or plant life in heaven, I'm looking forward to uh, digging into the Bible to share with you what we can find on that. Um, so those are some things that are coming up. I hope you're finding this uh, series to be helpful and I hope it's been encouraging to you. Uh, so with that, I want to start immediately with CBGM. A CBGM. What does that mean? Well, it's a technical term in CG, uh, CBGM, which is what I'm going to call it from now on. So I need you to try to remember what it is here, okay? CBGM stands for Coherence-Based Genealogical Method. And so now you're thinking, great, what does that mean? Uh, well, CBGM is a relatively new approach. I say relatively new. It really began to be in its formulating stages in around 1997 through about 2000. But it's a new approach uh, to textual criticism um, in using a computer program in order to determine the validity of a reading in the Bible. So to break it down to you, what it means is uh, scholars, textual scholars, are looking at the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament and they're using a computer to help them decide what verses ought to be in the Bible and what shouldn't be or what words ought to be in the Bible or what shouldn't be or whether or not it ought to say this word is versus that word okay so that kind of makes it a little uh, easier for you to understand what it is okay now the program uh, it's a computer application okay it it aggregates relationships between different readings, we'll call them readings, meaning a verse or a word or a verse or a word or a phrase in the Bible. And it looks at the agreement or the disagreements in those readings and it makes choices based upon the algorithms in deciding for you uh, what ought to be in the Bible and what shouldn't. Now, in practical usage, where two readings agree, uh, CBGM views that as implying a relationship between the two somehow. But when they disagree, then CBGM inquires the user. So maybe you get a pop-up window or something. I haven't actually seen the program in operation, so I don't know how it interacts with the user. But in some way, it inquires of the user, um, you know, how to relate the disagreement. And then it aggregates the disagreements in order to determine the relationship. Okay. Um, it is currently being used by the Institute for New Testament Textual Research. Uh, INTF is their, you know, their acronym. Okay, and uh, it's being used to produce a major critical edition, which uh, forms the basis of all critical texts. Okay, which is different than the Textus Receptus, which is what we use um, for the translation of the King James. Now it's. It's already been applied to what's referred to as the Catholic epistles, um, and they're now working on Mark and John and Acts. Um, there's a new Greek text, which is it's not real new, but it's new, um, the, the most recent, let's put it that way, called the NA28, um, and, and they use this database on that, okay? And they, they have left open now 43 passages which have now been marked in the text itself with black diamonds uh, saying that these are, you know, in question. These are undecided, basically. Um, now, before, now having explained all of that, what uh, the program is, 
I should probably give you a little bit of a understanding of the Greek text, okay? Um, so before we go any further, it might be helpful to remember that until the late 1800s, there really was only one type of text in use, and that was the Byzantine text type. Uh, the Textus Receptus is basically a construct from the Byzantine manuscripts, uh, which, you know, the Byzantine manuscripts, the family, the Byzantine family has a phenomenal level of agreement between the manuscripts in this text type. Uh, the disagreements are usually things like, you know, misspelled words, scribal errors, somebody skipped a word when they were copying, that sort of thing. It becomes obvious when you're looking at all of them that oh, this guy made a mistake here. Uh, so until the late 1800s, that was the only one in use, all right? Um, then in the late 1800s, uh, a group of men came together, a committee came together, and their, their first purpose for the committee was to uh, update what they believed to be archaic words in the King James Version. And before it was all over, they ended up going a completely different way with it, and uh, they took the Greek manuscripts and decided to rebuild things and with the interesting thing was that they took a handful of manuscripts from the Alexandrian text type, not the Byzantine, which was in use for, you know, hundreds of years, the only one that was being used for hundreds of years. Um, and now they're going to these Alexandrian manuscripts to build a new Greek text, which, um, you know, turned into the critical text. And that was in the late 1800s. And that's been revised again and again and again. Uh, over the over the last hundred and let's see eighteen eighty one till now you do the math okay it's been a while uh, anyway so and at this point I want to reiterate that it is extremely difficult for me to even consider that the Alexandrian text type is a true text type and the reason why is because there are so many disagreements in that family whereas in the Byzantine family you have phenomenal agreement. In the Alexandrian family, you have phenomenal disagreement. Uh, so I have a hard time even considering that a family. It's To me, it's more like a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, and then there's a third uh, text type. So you've got the Texas Receptus, which has been used since the first century all the way up till now. And then you've got the critical text, which they, which they built in 1881 is when they finished it and until now. And then the third one is called the majority text. Um, and that came into being in the early 1980s, and it is a, I, I call it a statistical construct um, of all known collated Greek manuscripts. Now, I need to stop there and say that we have close to 6,000 manuscripts, but not all of them have been collated. Some of them are so small, you, you know that it's a Greek manuscript of the Bible, but you can't really read it. There's only a few words on it, so you can't really place it in a family, and, you know, so a, a lot of those are not even useful. Um, the last time I checked, and it's been a few years, but the last time I checked, there were somewhere around 700 that had been actually collated, um, which means that they've been classified and examined and so forth. So with the majority text, they take all of the collated manuscripts and they compare them, and it's basically you know a vote kind of thing. This particular word has this many evidence, you know, manuscripts showing evidence for it, so we keep that. And, you know, it's like, uh, okay, so the word Lord has, you know, 100 votes here, but the word God has only 20 votes here, so we're going to go with Lord. And so that's what they did. And um, it's a bit more complicated than that. If you know anything about the majority text, I'm just trying to make it simple for our discussion because we're really not, we need to get back to this coherence-based genealogical method. Uh, but I, I need you to understand these things first. And so uh, with the majority manuscript is a bit more complicated, but um, what they ended up with was a Greek text that is fairly similar to the Texas Receptus. Why? Because the majority of the manuscripts that exist are Byzantine, so naturally you're going to get a text that strongly represents that, but not always. Um, there are, you know, roughly a, th a thousand and some differences between the majority text and the Texas Receptus. And you say, well, a thousand is a pretty big number. It is a big number, and it is an important number. The, the thing to remember is that God promised in his word that he was going to preserve his word to every generation. So uh, what we have, we, we, we have to have a manuscript that's perfect, okay? Um, so, but we have three competing manuscripts now. Now, if God promised to preserve his word to every generation, my default is the Texas Receptus because that was the only one that was in use 
for hundreds of years. Um, the last um, Alexandrian manuscript, I was going to say corrupted, but you know, okay. Uh, the last Alexandrian manuscript, I think is roughly around the 800s and 900s. Um, there's very few before that. Um, and then there's practically none after that. Um, so, you know, from like the 900s until now or so forth, um, that's all you really had was the, uh, was the, the Byzantine manuscripts or the Texas Receptus. I hope I didn't lose anybody there. If I did, go back, listen to it again. If you still got questions, email me. I'll be happy to share with you my limited knowledge in this area, okay? Now, uh, with all of that as background, I want to immediately point out that CBGM does not consider any of the readings from the Byzantine family. None. And for this reason, as much as the supporters of the critical text may want to deny it, and they do, it is still very much a biased approach. They've taken, you know, the majority of the manuscripts and they set them aside and they said, we're not going to use these. We're only going to use these, the Alexandrian manuscripts, with phenomenal disagreement. And we're going to sort through that and figure it all out, okay? Um, so it's biased. They're, they're not even considering all the manuscripts, okay? So it's already a biased approach. Now, the Concordia Theology Journal, which is a theology journal, if you're into that kind of thing, um, there, there's a journal for that, okay? Uh, they make an interesting point about text types. And I, I read this, and I, I'm just going to tell you what they said. Uh, but basically, they say that the classical text types the Byzantine family, the, the Alexandrian family, the, the, the Western family, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, things that go on with that. Uh, they said that they're not very meaningful, and they act, actually the, the text types constitute a poor way of determining the true text. Okay, that's what they said. It is better in their estimation uh, to examine all the text equally using CBGM. Um, and from what I've explained to you in, in our overview uh, of the three prominent Greek texts, uh, then that would lead the users of CBGM to a more of a majority text position because it sounds like you're doing the majority text thing there, except for one problem. Um, the users of the program are the ones who choose the manuscripts to consider, and they've ruled out the Byzantine family. So it's not even being used, all right? So basically, we're, we're just taking the critical text and adding more stuff, you know, adding more manuscripts and still coming out with a critical text. And we're not considering the, uh, the Textus Receptus, um, you know, Byzantine family text at all. So they speak of examining all the texts, but they don't really practice what they preach. Um, you know, in doing my research, I found that uh, CBGM, um, or let me, you know, it's a method. CBGM stands for method, but to be more appropriate, um, the, it's a computer program, which we're discussing here. Uh, and it's been described by some as kind of a black box because the information goes in, you don't see how it's really working in there, and then it spits out a product. Um, so, you know, the user is really just trusting the algorithms that have been written with certain rules in mind in order to do this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, speaking of the actual nuts and bolts of the computer application, one guy said this. Here's what he said. Unfortunately, the method remains little known outside of a small circle of dedicated New Testament textual critics. And even among textual critics, the method continues to confound. In other words, um, just a very small handful of guys decided how this was going to work. Apparently, either one of them or they found a computer programmer who could set all of this up for them, and they ran with it. Okay, Now, computers are helpful. I'm using one right now. I love computers. I'm what you would call a 58-year-old techie, okay? Uh, they're rare, but they do exist. Here I am, okay? But the bottom line is, if we think that a computer uh, will rule out possible bias in selecting one text over the other, uh, then we're ignoring the obvious. The, the bias occurs when the program is constructed or when the scholars decide what manuscripts to put through the process. So CBGM is not simply a computer application. It requires user input and editorial judgment, okay? Um, and it's already been admitted that the Byzantine text from which we get the Textus Receptus, from which the King James is translated, was not even considered in the process. You go out and do your own research. You'll see that what I'm telling you is absolutely true. 
Uh, if you got any questions, I, I keep my references for where I read, you know, especially controversial stuff. And I can send those references to you and you can see it for yourself. Uh, so what do we end up with? We end up with a product which has a clear bias against the Byzantine text slash Texas Receptus. Now, if that's not bias, what is it? You tell me if that's not bias, all right? Um, my approach to the Bible and my approach to textual criticism, um, and I like to call it textual analysis, is um, by using the logic of faith, all right? Um, when you consider it from a theological approach, believing as I do that God has providentially preserved every word that he's given by inspiration, I cannot accept any method, no matter how technical it may be, no matter how much smarter the other guy may be, um, and there's a lot of guys out there much smarter than me, I'll tell you that, but I can't accept any method, no matter how scientific, that calls in question the preservation of Scripture. Um, why do we even need CBGM? Why are the scholars still trying to reclaim the original text, which they don't even they don't even call it the original text because they don't really believe we can get back that far? And they'll tell you if you read, you'll, they'll tell you that their approach can detail. They'll say this: it can detail the exact description or the exact manuscript or the exact form, however you want to put that, going back as far as 125 A.D. Great, but I hate to tell you this: um, the originals were written, you know long before that. So you haven't accomplished anything. You haven't really discovered the original. And even if they could go back to 125 AD, that's still at least 30 years later from the closest original. So what have we really gained? CBGM has gained nothing. So what's the point? Um, and I believe, whereas I believe it's all settled, we have a settled text, I believe that. Um, even the Bible tells us that you know, that the words of God are, are, are preserved. The Bible tells us that forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So I believe it's settled, but they don't. They believe that they have to keep digging and keep looking and keep tweaking this and, you know, keep tweaking that. Um, they don't believe that the text is settled. They believe it's in constant flux and we're constantly having to rediscover new things or, or fix this or fix that. So what does that mean? That means up till now, we haven't had the pure word of God. That doesn't set well with me, all right? Um, I, in my reading, I came across the title of a, of a paper written by a guy named Peter J. Gurry, and he, he this is how he titled his paper. He said, How Your Greek New Testament is Changing. Hmm. Immediately, I'm like, oh, no, here we go. And then his title goes on, A Simple Introduction to the Coherence-Based Genealogical Method. So he admits, even in his title, that this computer application approach uh, is changing the text of the New Testament. Uh, another article I read, there was a website called Religion Unplugged, and immediately you go, what? But uh, it, it made the statement. It said, a revolution now underway will gradually change every future English translation of the New Testament that you're reading. So what does that do to the promises of preservation? Do, do we have a Bible that is pure, that is true, that we can trust or not? Um, CBGM was a contributor, and I mentioned this earlier, to the New American, uh, the Nestle Allen uh, 28 text, okay? That's what it's called. Uh, you could call it the critical text. You could call it an eclectic text. A lot of people are calling it that. Uh, some people are still calling it the Westcott Hort text, though it's evolved tremendously since Westcott and Hort's day in 1881. But uh, anyway, it's contributed to the NA28 uh, based on 123 manuscripts. That's what they used from James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. Okay, so that's what they used. And you're thinking, well, that's not very much scripture. You know, there's so much more in the New Testament, and you're right. Um, but even in this small selection, there were 34 changes from the NA27 to the NA28. And the CBGM is to be the basis for all future critical text editions. And that's what they tell you right up front. So what does it mean? Um, it means that there are more changes to come. Uh, it means that, according to them, the the Bible is still in a state of constant change. Um, and then it gets worse than that, because every time they change the Greek in their critical text, then, you know, every time they discover a new manuscript that the experts consider to be reputable, they're going to feed that in their database, and they're going to produce even more changes. 
And what happens once they update their Greek text? You go NA27 and, you know, they do translations based on that. Then NA28 and we do translations based on that. And a lot of people go back and fix some of the other translations that were based on 27. And it goes on and on and on. So with all of this happening, it's not surprising to me that churches are filled with believers who have been duped into believing that the Bible has errors in it. Um, you know, I, I would expect that this new method would or should introduce more certainty to Bible re readers, uh, leading to more confidence in the Bible, but that's not the case. Instead, now we find a greater number of places uh, which have been deemed uncertain. They call them uncertain. They put a little black diamond beside it to tell you that that is an uncertain reading. So here you are as you're reading along and you see the black diamond and then immediately you're going, hmm, I don't know if I can trust that or not. Well, look, in my Bible, there's no black diamonds and I read it and I trust it. All right. Some people say, well, you're trusting on blind faith and you're trusting this and you're, I trust it. Okay. All I know is that 36 years ago, this Bible turned me from a wicked sinner into the man I am now. And I'm certainly not perfect, but I'm a whole lot better than I used to be. And anybody could, that knew me then can tell you that now, all right? And the Bible did that, all right? So yeah, I trust it. Uh, so this program, rather than lending itself to greater assurance in God's word, it's actually leading to greater doubt, all right? Now, aren't you glad we have computers? I am. Uh, maybe with the help of technology, uh, we'll finally be able to, this is what they're thinking, okay? I'm being sarcastic here. Uh, with the help of technology, we're going to get a trustworthy text. But apparently, God was not powerful enough to protect what he gave. So thankfully, we have genius men uh, who can do what God apparently could not. And hopefully, you know I'm being sarcastic. Um, sarcasm, by the way, is one of my dominant traits. And so I'm being sarcastic. Of course, we can't be smarter than God. Um, and of course, we cannot do what, if God couldn't do it, we certainly can't, okay? Now, God has promised to preserve his words, and I believe we have an all-powerful God, and I believe he did. So, I don't think that we need to rediscover or, or fix or find anything. Um, in my readings on the subject of CBGM, I discovered that it was applied to the Catholic letters, and I mentioned that. The editor's uh, found that, and this was interesting to me, they found that a number of Byzantine witnesses were surprisingly similar to their own reconstructed text. So what does that mean? They looked at what they finished, the computer spit it out, pff, here they go, they're looking at it and they're going, huh, that looks like these Byzantine readings over here. What does that mean? Well, that's interesting because they never included the Byzantine manuscripts in, in there, they never fed that in, but now when it spit it out, it, it came out with, you know, some Byzantine readings. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that according to their all-knowing computer program, there are Byzantine readings hidden in their precious Alexandrian manuscripts, but they're not going to admit that, all right? They're not. I read that in one place. I read it in one place. I couldn't even validate it. I'm not even sure it's actually true, so let me just give you that as a caveat. It may not even be true, but if it is true, that's amazing, but you're not going to get them to admit that. Uh, several of those who are in the know on this method now believe that the only text type that exists is the Byzantine text type. And this is due to their incredible agreement uh, between the manuscripts. So what about the rest? What about the Alexandrian family? And what about the Western uh, text and so forth? Well, you can't really call them a text type because there's so much disagreement. So please tell me why we are taking all of these things that are in disagreement and feeding it into a computer to, and, and thinking that somehow by feeding it a bunch of things that are in disagreement, things with errors, things with mistakes, we're going to feed all of that in and somehow it's going to spit out a perfect product? It doesn't make sense. The last time I read my Bible, it said that a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. And, you know, uh, a bad tree doesn't produce good, tr good fruit and a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. You get the point. You feed garbage in, you get garbage out, okay? That's computer. Everybody knows that. Gigo is an old term we used to use many moons ago. Uh, gigo means garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put in there is what you're going to get back. So it can be easily shown that CBGM, um, and this has been proven, it can allow an errant reading, a mistaken reading, to slip into the text. In other words, as the program considers all of these variant readings, 
uh, it can actually choose the wrong one. Um, a good example of that is in Jude 1 5. And in Jude 1 5, the NA28 uh, has Jesus, all right? While the NA27 had Lord. So they changed Lord to Jesus. Um, anyone who is even remotely familiar with the passage, in Jude 1 5, talks about how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. It says the Lord, okay, in the King James. It says the Lord, Curios, in the Texas Receptus, and it says Curios in the Byzantine family from which we get the Texas Receptus, from which we get the King James. I hope you followed all that. So it's Lord, but they changed it to Jesus. Um, if you know the Old Testament story, you know that Jesus did not take them out of Egypt. You read the Old Testament passages, it never says Jesus did that. Now, Jesus is God, so Jesus did it. I got that. You know, if you're going to use that argument, let's go, let's do this, you know. But the reality is, they changed the word from Lord, which of course could apply to God and does, um, to Jesus. So, what happened? The CBGM chose the wrong reading and put it in the text. And that's in the NA28. If you know Greek, uh, you can go out online and look up NA28 online and go to Jude 1.5 and you can look and see very clearly that the word Jesus or the word Jesus is there. Okay, um, So they changed it from right to wrong. Okay, According to the CBGM, the Jesus reading had good coherence. What does that mean? Sticks well. Uh, because it's found among some closely related witnesses, so that's the one they went with. In other words, what they're saying is that um, they took some uh, manuscripts that all had the same mistake, and they said, well, because they all had the same mistake, that must be right. Uh, how in the world can these people be so smart and so mistaken at the same time? I, I, I do not know. Um, several manuscripts had the same mistake, so they must be right. Does that make sense? Not one bit. But that's what they did. So in summary, which is a Baptist way of saying, now 10 more minutes, right? In summary, what do we have with CBGM? The same conflict we've always had. Nothing new has happened. Um, there's a couple of phrases, ipsissima verba and ipsissima vox. Okay, don't worry about it. The very words of God or the very voice or basically the gist of the idea. But now we've got it with a technical flair. All right, that's all we've done. We've added a little bit of technology to the same old argument. Uh, Christian. Beware of any approach to the scriptures that is based on the idea that we still have to find or rediscover uh, the original text. God preserved his word, and that settles it, whether you believe it or not. All right. Um, I used about 27 minutes on that discussion. That's my passion. You know, the Bible and the text is my passion. Uh, so, I unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to have time to get to the Bible and what the Bible has to say about alcohol today. Um, so I'm going to leave that until next week. But I will, I will say this. Um, believer, the Bible has lots of promises concerning how God preserved his word. All right? And so I, I want you to, to keep that in mind. Uh, God has preserved his word. And what you have, if, if you're using a you know, Textus Receptus-based Bible, the King James, um, then you have God's God's word. Okay, you don't need to doubt it. You don't need to read it. There's no black diamonds to say that a reading is uncertain. There's no footnotes to you know. You go down to the bottom of the page and says, well, actually, we're not sure that this ought to be in there or anything like that. Okay, you have God's word. You can trust it. Uh, so with that, I'm I'm sorry if you were waiting for me to get to the Bible and beverage alcohol. Um, sorry, I'll have to wait until next week for that. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up here. So CBGM, big, long, fancy name. Uh, the guy that asked me about that, you know, he said, uh, Pastor, what do you think about CBGM? And I said, what's CBGM? He said, Coherence-Based Genealogical Method. He had to look it up because he couldn't remember the acronym. He looked it up. He says, Coherence-Based Genealogical Method. And I said, great. Define that. What do you mean by that? How does it apply? What does it apply to? So... Uh, this has been going on, like I said, it you know kind of started coming in fruition in 1997, and it's now becoming a big deal, and that's what they're using. Uh, but it's the same old argument. It is 
we have to rediscover the Word of God. We don't have to rediscover it. God preserved it. He gave it to every, gener every generation. Psalm 100, verse 5. All right? Uh, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. We, we don't have to find God's Word. He's taking care of preserving that for us. All right? So I'm going to wrap that up here. Um, I, it was very technical today. I hope I didn't lose you. If I did, I'll say two things. First of all, it's incredibly important that you understand this subject. It's an issue that we are going to be dealing with for years to come. And then secondly, you know, just go back and listen to everything I said again. It was a shotgun format, blamity, blamity, blam. Um, I hope I didn't lose you and I hope you find it to, uh, you know, you'll go back and listen to it again and be able to pick up some things. Um, I've actually written a book that's on sale um, on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and, you know, about 16 different bookstores that you can buy it uh, online. Um, called In Defense of the Textus Receptus. So um, I want to encourage you to go out there and buy the book. There's actually two revisions. There's the first one and then the second one. That's what two revisions are <clears throat> because I made some spelling mistakes and some grammatical mistakes and you proofread and proofread and proofread and you get 15 other people to proofread and you think it's perfect and you print it out and you're all excited. You got your book and you buy your first copy and you read it and you open it up on page three. There's something dumb. And you go, <coughs> You know, and every time you redo it, it costs money. So it's like, well, I'm going to do revision two. Maybe in a few years, I'll find more grammatical problems. I have to do revision three. But I'm encouraging you to buy revision two, okay? The spelling and typos have been fixed in that one as far as I know. So with that, God bless you, and I hope you have a wonderful week. And uh, remember this, uh, live your life in the reality of God's presence. Being ever aware that God is with you will change your attitude. It will change your actions. God bless you and have a great week.